Deborah Kennedy is an eco artist, educator, lecturer, and the author of Nature Speaks Art and Poetry for the Earth, a profound collection of her original artwork and poetry. I found out that you had come from the East Coast and had quite an interesting life here in California for many, many years. And hopefully you'll be able to share some of that with our group today. It was fascinating. Along the way, you got a, a degree in art from UC Berkeley and a Master of Fine Arts from San Jose State University. I noticed that she brought her books and some of her artwork today and that this book received a very prestigious award, Nautilus Book Award. And really, it's a beautiful collection of her work, her art, and her words. So please help me today to welcome our speaker, Deborah Kennedy. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Debbie and Arthur, and everyone who made this possible. And I'm really happy because my whole family's here, and so it was close enough to home and a good day. Uh, it's really great to have my family here. And uh, a little nerve-wracking because uh, the guys are both rather accomplished professional speakers on their own and uh, but my son really got me here I he received a humanist uh, card in the mail and uh, he represented the humanists on the religious life council at Princeton and brought a little different perspective to the council I think and uh, also read at graduation a humanist statement so uh, so the younger generation bringing the word and uh, you know near and dear to me as Al Gore wrote about the attack on reason and science that's going on today very very discouraging uh, it's nice to see people who are still embracing logic reason and uh, and science right so uh, so very nice so we have about 40 minutes here that I'm going to be presenting and uh, you know I'm a teacher so I, I like talk to the minute and uh, so I step the clock right there so uh, uh, I'm reminded of um, a third grade girl who, very precocious, wrote a book report about Socrates. And so she wrote, Socrates was a great man. He talked a lot. They killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so people who blab for a living, you know, and who, who are advancing thinking and philosophy, you know, like some cautionary words here, right? So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we will have time for comments and questions at the end and answers. So, uh, as uh, Debbie, thank you so much for your kind introduction. And um, if we could get a little less light, it might be, uh, might be a good thing. Um, so that is the uh, cover. There we go. Yeah. So uh, what a great screen and projector here. I, I used to teach art history with slides and you had such clarity in the images and now my LCD projector at school it's sort of like well if you could see the color in this it would look like that you know but it's good to see that science is improving this technology finally so yeah and actually I got two national book awards okay the Nautilus I won in poetry and that is books for a better world but I thought you might like the second one which had a considerably less attractive decal but um, it's from uh, Eric Hoffer and he was a moral philosopher came from a blue-collar background and became quite an accomplished uh, author and wrote about the social conditions that lead to the rise of authoritarianism uh, his words I think today are, are very important to revisit so I know you are some deep thinkers you might want to look back at Eric Hoffer's work uh, one of the things that that hit me when I was looking over some of his work was that um, if society changes too rapidly, it throws some people into an immature state. 
and then they seek authoritarian structures. So I'm thinking, you know, gay marriage, transgender bathrooms, uh, black president, all just too much, right? So some very interesting uh, work that he did. Um, so very honored. It's it's uh, an award for free thinking authors, huh? Okay, that should do, that should do it. So. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at some of my earlier artwork, and uh, I'll also be uh, then reading some poetry from my book and showing you some of the uh, art that I created along with it there. So, um, this is uh, a piece that I created in 1989. That's the Berlin Wall. And so my husband had, he's a professor at Santa Clara, and he had an academic grant, a Fulbright grant, and we went to Germany, and I knew that artists did work on the wall. And so I went there, kind of prepared to do this, and I uh, brought the hopes and fears of ordinary people from America. And then I gathered them from people in East Berlin, uh, which was then under uh, the control of a military police state, right? And also from West Berlin. And I inscribed them in these metal plates so people divided by the wall spoke together about their basic concerns. And from a distance, it looked a little bit like a window. Sometimes the metal would pick up the light and people would actually think that they were seeing sunlight coming through the wall. So that was sort of another, sort of the metaphoric level of defeating the wall there. And, uh, oh, who's that girl? We don't know. <laughs> so, uh, this was a little while ago. <laughs> and, um, you know, so uh, the actual border between East Berlin and West Berlin was 12 feet out from the wall. And uh, as I was working, I had somebody down at the corner, and they would yell at me when the East German military and police would come out. So this is the ninth time they came out, and when they did, I would go back over the border. Uh, so this man in the front with that strong jaw, some people have looked at this and gone like, did you hire him? I was going, no, 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 that's Stasi, okay, that's the secret police. The men in the jodfers and the high boots were uh, Stasi, the secret police police of East Germany. So, you know, they used extrajudicial uh, killings, uh, assassination, you know, really assassinating their own citizens, um, imprisonment and torture. Uh, it, was, it was, you know, pretty uh, highly effective uh, military police state. And, uh, you know, the Stasi had 20% of the population spying on everyone else. They'd find out a little something about you that you didn't want to get out, you know. People could not speak in front of their own family members. And I'm sure I have a Stasi file. You can, you can go find out what they're, because <laughs> I was there for, you know, a month. And um, so, so I've thought about trying to get at it. They, they do disperse files now, but I, it was all, the forms were all in German. And I went, oh, God. Uh, but anyhow, um, so this is the ninth time they came out, and he had a video camera. And uh, so he's uh, taping the piece, and then he turned around, and there were 150 people over the border watching all this. So this was kind of the most tense moment during the, the whole day, because people on this side, of course, hated the Stasi and the surveillance. But actually, I was uh, became friends with one of the uh, American military guards, right? So um, West Berlin at this time was under the administration of the United States and Britain and France. And so he said, they probably don't have film in the camera. <laughs> they were so broke at this point. The cameras were sort of substituting as, you know, sort of a uh, sign of dominance and so on, you know. So, um, so this was Deborah's big adventure over there. And um, so these are all German tourists reading the text there. And, uh, you know, this was one of my early text-based pieces, and some of the comments people made were very um, poignant, you know. I fear that people's harder, hearts go ever, grow ever harder. And um, that, uh, you know, in the East they would say things like, I wish things were otherwise. That's it. <laughs> So, uh, you know, how does that um, uh, relate to my current environmental work? 
Six months later, those people transformed their society from the bottom up. And I feel we need some serious, if we want to have a thriving uh, biosphere and thriving people, we need to make some profound changes. And so for me, it's very inspiring that they were capable of making uh, this level of change. When I came back, I was in the newspaper because of this, because the wall came down, and then you know I did some public art. And through doing the public art, uh, the first piece is called Ecotech, and it's up on the light rail system at the Champion Court Station. And that was the first time I started working with environmental issues. And I started understanding how to bring together my love of the natural world and my, my concern about it with my artwork. Some years later, I had an exhibition at the De Sassé Museum at Santa Clara University. I taught a class there in conjunction with this. And this is one of the shows that I did in conjunction with that, and it's called Project Nexus. So Nexus is connections, and you see in the front here, uh, this large device, it became like a musical instrument. And it's also an illustration of a scientific uh, drawing that Professor W.D. Billings did that I'm going to show you in a minute. So uh, this installation, chip bark all over the floor. There was a soundtrack as though you're walking through the woods and hearing different soundscapes. And there was this wall of suspended leaves. And then that was the ring of the lost in the back. So that's the parts of nature that are already gone. We can't really do anything about that. But here's the ring of life in the front with the burning bush over it. I used a religious symbol because I was at a Jesuit institution. And uh, the burning bush is one of the few times that uh, a plant, or it was, a, it was a divine symbol in the West, right? In the Western tradition here. So um, this is what you were looking at there. I call this the ring of life. And this is based on, as I say, Professor Billings' work. And I actually got to talk with him. Uh, but he was quite elderly and had retired at this point. And I sort of simplified it a little bit. Um, so those strings are all, it's all piano technology. And students created compositions to be able to play on it from the human position. It's like, what are the vibrations we're sending out into the world? And so this is his original drawing. He told me he did it in his little office at Duke University. And pretty good drawing. I was pretty impressed, actually. You know? <laughs> and uh, so this is called the Holocoanotic Theory of Environmental Complexity, or the yarn ball theory, a little more friendly. And so around the outside are all the forces and substances that act and interact to create a living environment. He was a botanist for a plant. But really, pretty much with the, just some slight adaptations, you can put yourself there. And so he was the first botanist to really start looking at the biosphere from a holistic viewpoint. Uh, very often, the botanists, it's also complex and confused. They would just alter water or sunlight, one little element. He was kind of like, no, we have to understand how the whole thing works together. So on the outside, you know, it, it really the Greeks were trying to figure this out. We have earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, but he has sun there for that. And other plants and animals and the temperature and terrestrial radiation and solar radiation, cosmic radiation, uh, gravity, time, the parent materials, our ancestors, uh, topography, geography. So it's that all the forces and substances that interact to create you know, conditions for life. And, uh, you know, for me, it's one, a beautiful image of the web of life, but also it tells us so much about our position in the world. So the old Christian idea of the chain of being with God at the top, and then angels, and then man, and then women, and then uh, <laughs> animals, plants, go down, 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 right? No, humans are just one point on the outside edge of this circle. So, you know, like King Arthur's uh, table, that's, that circle is about equality, right? And also it shows the interdependence and the complexity and that life is really about relationships. Uh, I think that, uh, especially in the Western world, we tend to think of ourselves as independent units. Right? But I'm deeply connected to whatever place 
that egg I ate this morning, the way it was, right? And those creatures and the lives they live. So we're a lot more like sponges with a tremendous amount of materiel going through us, right? Water, air, and so on. And, and that tells us about that. And it also tells us that because all the parts are interconnected, if one little part goes, it affects all the other parts, right? So that's the interdependence. So I'd like to take a moment, I'm just sort of experimenting with doing this. The Poet Laureate of San Jose has this beautiful singing voice, you know. And I said, God, that is so great to have a performative element. So I have my ocean drum here. And uh, I am working on a, this is, you notice this is blue, right? So this was a big step for me. I worked on this book for 10 years and I used all uh, earth toned inks, right? Because a lot of the early brown inks were made out of uh, soil, right? But after 10 years, it was like blue, <laughs> working in blue. <laughs> very exciting. So these are very intricate drawings of plankton. These are phytoplankton, the little plants that exist in water. And when I went to school, I was taught that, you know, it was trees and land plants that were making our oxygen. It turns out that phytoplankton produce almost 50% of our oxygen, right? So I thought in the spirit of our holocoanotic theory here, we would take a moment and connect, okay? Just become aware of your breathing. And I'm going to use my ocean drum for just a few seconds here, okay? And we're going to imagine how we're connected to that plankton that's producing our oxygen, okay? <laughs> I didn't bring my thunder drum, but I think I will next time. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so um, now we're going to move on to uh, the first poem that I'm going to be reading. And this is a paean or a celebratory poem for Professor Billings and his work. So you can see this is the illustration and I've drawn a part of his yarn ball there and then there's the sun, there's pollen, water, and air. So some of those basic uh, substances that uh, create the conditions for our life. I think that sometimes we need to remember, you know, so I'm talking to my college students and I go like, your lives are all deeply woven into the web of life and, you know, dependent on the natural world. And I can see him kind of going like, what's she talking about? <laughs> My relation, some of them, you know, their relationship to the natural world is, and they've told me this, I walk from my house to a car, I drive somewhere, I get out of the car, and I walk to the building, right? And so, and, but then I go like, well, three minutes, that's all you get without oxygen, right, in our lives. Three days without water, about three weeks without food. These are all the gifts of nature, and we need to feel the gratitude and the respect, right, for those gifts. So really, that's, the, that's sort of the impulse uh, with this particular piece, Web of Life. And you'll hear me kind of, uh, you know, going through those forces and substances in this, uh, in this poem. Bind together the blooming air, water dancing from pole to frozen pole. The sun's touch brings light to steamy life. The loamy earth, the patient plants, and all the animals' secret family wed by blood. The sacred fire lights the dark, 
and leaves pure ash. Spin each thread strong and supple, every strand lit with honey's glow. Weave the cloth an endless circle. Here and there, you and me, all the ones who came before, ancient kin to every pilgrim who walks the path. Life long and loud sings and whistles and croaks and howls. In our metal days, machine and man clash and grind. This once fine cloth used so hard, gaping holes torn side to side. Edges fray like fine down feathers. Our broken fingernails black with grease, knuckles grazed with scars. Bind each living fiber, mend the tears, renew the web, until the deserts hum with life and leaf again. So the way the book is set up, there's an illustration and then a poem, and then there's a short essay too. Uh, so a lot of young people who have uh, bought the book, I had a show at my uh, school over at San Jose City College, they said they learned a lot about ecology and science because I'm, kind of, I'm using the art and poetry to try and engage people and in, in, get them to engage with these ideas, but I also have, you know, some science and some stuff. I want people to really get that, right? So I kind of use this uh, multimedia mode to do that. And actually there's an old tradition my son found out that goes back to ancient Greece where they kind of do this, where they would have uh, essays and they often had satire and poems all mixed together, right? So that's the web of life and uh, I'm thinking here a little bit about that old saying, humans are preceded by forests and followed by deserts, right? So, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, difficult times for the natural world, as I know all you know, because uh, you're, you're tracking on this. Uh, okay, so that is the web of life. And, you know, it's sort of a foundational concept for me, is, is that, uh, that concept that uh, Professor Billings developed there. Oops, sorry. Okay. Uh -oh. And then get this all wicked up here. There we go. Okay. So um, my illustrations that are not my own are from Wiki Commons, and you can see the. Uh, oops, it's kind of getting cut off down there. But um, at the end, I have attribution to all the wonderful people at Wiki Media Commons who share their images. So this is a wonderful painting by John Collier of uh, Darwin. And uh, so this next poem is based on a story about Darwin. And um, when I first heard it, uh, the story was that he had gone to Kew Gardens, right? So the Victorian England, they were just like fascinated with all these foreign plants as they went out as this colonizing force. Uh, and they would bring back orchids. They were just loved orchids. And their explorers would go out and just tear through an entire jungle, pack a boat with orchids. Two thirds of them would die on the way home. But you know, the ones that were left, they, they, they really prized. And uh, you know, Kew Gardens, this wonderful uh, greenhouse. And he discovered uh, at some point the Madagascar Star of Bethlehem. And I want to point out these long spurs, see those green tubes hanging down? They're a foot long and they have a little bit of nectar at the bottom. So we'll hear what, uh, what Darwin uh, thought about all this and how this kind of unfolded. So this is really the first poem and it's the cover of the book as well. So it's another foundational kind of concept in the book. It's called Coevolution. Darwin walked beneath iron arches and crystal sky, the dangerous liquid scent of distant jungles 
hanging heavy in the proper London air. In Kew Gardens, the conservatory, a cathedral grand dedicated to botany, he gazed upon the Star of Bethlehem, an orchid exiled from the heights of Madagascar. Each petal carved from ivory's gleam, blooming in the velvet night. Beneath the celestial petals grow strange spurs, nectaries, green whips hanging 12 inches long, tips wet with juice, the honeyed lure. From the negative, Darwin saw the positive. He wrote, good heavens, what insect could suck it? <coughs> Only an insect with a proboscis, a nose improbable, one foot long. His revelation met with waves of ridicule crashing from Britain to the continent. Laughter rippled through 40 years until the night an entomologist with animal eyes silently waiting high in the trembling jungle captured the shadow of the hawk moth. Its shaggy wings, eight inches wide, beat through layered leaves following the scent of musk. The hawk moth hovered before the radiant star. Its slender snout coiled tight, unfurled its length, probed down the orchid spur, sipped the nectar and bore away a fine coat of pollen. Darwin's vision, a spark through golden amber, orchid and moth in eager embrace, two bound as one across Eon's arc. Thank Thanks so much. So an amazing story here and a story of coevolution of two species that evolved together, literally driving each other to greater lengths over millions of years. And uh, here's an image of the uh, actual hawk moth. So it's prehensile, right? It can uncoil this prehensile proboscis and probe all the way down there, right? To get that bit of nectar and fertilize the orchids. So an astounding story of how uh, two species, coevolution is really two species, and how knit together they are, right? So they're really dependent upon each other for their survival. But one of the things that I invite you to think about, and I think we all need to think about, is that when you think that whole circle, right, the air and the soil and the water and all of that that we evolved with no longer exists. We've changed the water, we've changed the air, we've changed the soil, right? It, when it rains, pesticides come down very often in the, in the water. So my thought is, you know, coevolution is really two species, but we evolved in relationship to that whole yarn ball of forces and substances. How do we imagine that we're going to keep evolving fast enough to keep up with these changes? Uh, there's also, there's already a lot of evidence that we're not doing well at that, right? We're kind of culling the flock uh, of people who can't adapt fast enough, sadly. So that's coevolution. My next uh, poem is uh, called Double Vision. And there are two parts to the poem. And the first part, I'm in Rome, and uh, I'm going into the Pantheon, this extraordinary building. It, it's the best per preserved ancient Roman building, cast out of concrete. It's almost a perfect sphere inside. And at the top, there's an oculus 28 feet across. So I think of it as a giant eyeball. I think that's the, I've never read that, but I think that's what they were really imitating, right? It's like being inside an enormous eye. 
And uh, because, you know, the Christians, of course, uh, did not think too much of the pagans, and they basically used the forum and most uh, ancient Roman buildings as they just mined them, right? So St. Peter's is made from rock from the forum and so on. But this was reconsecrated, so it survived that period of destruction. <clears throat> so the first part is uh, I'm there in Rome. Oh boy. And uh, the second part, I'm in my backyard. I don't know, this is kind of faint. Can you see the halo there? Okay, so this is called a, um, a moon halo. Have you seen these? We get them quite a lot here. And uh, so it's when there's a thin layer of uh, ice crystals that are octagonal. And it breaks up the light and creates this halo. The one I was looking at was much brighter. The moon was full. It was directly overhead. And you actually get like a little purple on the inner edge of it, like a rainbow. So I just wanted you to be able to visualize uh, some of this. And there's the illustration for double vision. So these poems are all from the first section of the book, which kind of focuses on how deeply woven we are into the web of life. There's four sections. The second, so that's living inside the circle, every part wedded to the whole. And then the second section is called careless hands, reeking and reaping. So that's sort of the damage we're doing to the larger natural world. And then the third section is beautiful poisons bearing the burden. So that's sort of how some of our bad behaviors coming back at us, uh, hormone disruption and so on. And uh, the last section, revealing relationships, and it's the longest section, really, it is. <laughs> it's about uh, trying to find pathways to healing our relationship with the natural world. So here's double vision. <clears throat> it has these two sections. So section one here. Raising crystal eyes to a vestal sky, endless web of silver lake blue, untouched by time but rent by rock, stone arches surge to broken crests, etched and scarred. Wandering tangled streets, chilled water from ancient aqueducts, sits like a polished river rock in my belly. Rome, past and present, picked over bones of an endless feast. Entering the sunken stone of orb, stone orb, home to all the gods. The sweeping span leads eyes up to a shaft of light, piercing a pounding oculus. The sun coils at my still feet slowly burning an ellipse into the stone floor. Two. Twenty years pass, my feet flat on my own land. The full moon rises to a blazing zenith, hovers at the center of the sky, dressed in sheer clouds, circled by a halo, ice and crystal light. The nine circles of heaven spin, etched against a raven sky. My tender hand, shadow on this sterling disk, feels every echo beat against the stone, bearing swelling life full and aching. Each open eye, each yielding nerve, reaches, straining to see, to hear the land lying beyond this thin veil. All around the breath of an unheard, whispering world. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so moonbows, uh, you know, we have so much uh, nature around us. And uh, I've always been very grateful that my, my washing machine was out in the garage. Because this was often the reason I was out wandering around at night. And I got to see some of this spectacular stuff. It, you know, people are so engaged with their screens now. Uh, I think that less and less, uh, you know, appreciating nature and looking up uh, is really... It's, it's something we always have uh, for, for all of us there as a resource. <clears throat> uh, 
<laughs> okay, this piece is called La Femme Savante. And uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, really about climate change and uh, given the recent news and uh, sending our, our sad thoughts to the people who are uh, receiving the brunt of this. So this is in Careless Hands, Reeking and Reaping. And uh, really this is based on um, La Femme Savante. Femme Savants, uh, I know you all know about the Enlightenment. Somehow, I was never taught about it in school. I had to discover this on my own, even though these are foundational concepts to our country. My gosh, how could that be, right? So, uh, the Enlightenment, uh, late 1700s, France, and really they started these humanist ideas. I mean, I guess in the Renaissance also, and ancient Greece, but really uh, became foundational to a new societies. So uh, their meme was, dare to think, right? And uh, before this came the Rococo period. And I'm teaching art history, the Rococo period, a lot of curly cues. <laughs> Somehow not my favorite type of art. In fact, I sort of abhorred it. But my idea is with through education, you can appreciate almost anything more deeply. So I started researching it. I found out that the women of the Rococo period had these salons. And they would bring together, some of them are described as like, it's like playing an orchestra. They would bring together different people from different orders of society, which was very hierarchical at that point. And they would bring them together in their salons. And many of them were philosophes, the men who were laying the foundation for the Enlightenment. And they complained bitterly that in the salons they had to adhere to a more civil discourse. But I believe, and some other uh, historians have written about this, that this helped. Uh, you know, the philosophes were more like you think about talk radio today. They just get together and scream at each other and leave. But in these environments, they had to actually talk with each other and advanced, it helped advance their thinking. And some of the femme savants, you know, and this was kind of a new idea that women should be educated, right? Um, the, uh, the long life partner of Voltaire, Emily de Chatelet, her mother said her father was letting her be educated. She was brilliant. She became a brilliant mathematician. Her formula underlie the E equals MC squared concept. We've never heard of her, right? But um, her mother said, oh, don't educate her, who will marry her, right? <laughs> we both like partners that aren't that lippy, right? <laughs> both sides. So uh, I'm doing research on femme savants, and, uh, oops, and um, so uh, I'm sitting at my computer, and uh, you know, this is a little bit satirical uh, poem here. La femme savante. Sunlight through yellow leaves, the early heat promises a scorching day. This morning should be cool, muffled gray, sitting at my computer, sinking into a swill of pixels, reading brief histories of enlightened women and the deluge of news, trawling for the most despicable morsels to share at dinner. <laughs> Words ricochet inside my electronic echo chamber. Each plain thought sinks in a torrent of static. Science scorned as just a theory. Deceptions swirl like muddy water across a billion screens. Where is the glittering hostess of the Republic of Letters? Enlightenment savant reborn in heliotrope brocade edged with Flemish lace, head balanced on an ivory neck. With wry repost, she reviles this willful descent of modern medieval minds, spewing mouthfuls of cold gruel and old lard in every headline. With wicked retort, cut through their clamor. Remember, the world is not a digital dream. Nature equals food times seven billion mouths. My fingers click, my eyes twitch, 
as the electronic news pulse tells all. Floodwaters churn in Brazil, Colombia, Pakistan, Thailand, Romania, and in China, that coal-burning miracle, too. Wisconsin farmlands planted and harvested by broad, worn hands for six generations turn to rushing, turbid, toxic rivers. All followed by dust bowl droughts around the world. Texans burn in parched fields and call for more ardent prayer. It's the first time I've thought, you've gotten to laugh on that. Thank you. I, yes, I am, I'm here with the humanists. Uh, Okay, talking heads dismiss all research round the globe, confusing lonely facts for a body of knowledge. My phantasm philosopher proposes, if you wish to live outside the fierce embrace of the Enlightenment, if you ridicule the cautious computations of weather casters from the four directions, then renounce all the merciful gifts of science. No four hours of heart surgery or dainty dentistry. Do not even sip from our endless electronic fountains or gaze at our shimmering screens. Sit silent in your dank cells, praying to absent gods while we heal the sky. <laughs> The Unitarians were not as excited about that poem. <laughs> Despite being fairly broad-minded religious people, I would say. So, uh, thank you. Um, so, this uh, image, you know, so that's uh, Madame Pompadour, who was uh, uh, a great supporter of the Enlightenment and helped protect some of the Enlightenment figures and uh, helped fund the encyclopedia. And then behind them, you might be able to see a woman with her son on a on a car in rising waters. So, um, you know, that's about uh, all I get time-wise. Can I do one more? Five more minutes? Okay. All right, so let's skip forward here. Okay, that's, I think you guys know this. Okay, <laughs> like, ah! Uh, okay, so uh, let's see. That's secrets. That's about chemicals. I think we're not going to do that. We need to get to pathways to healing here, okay? And I think what I will do is um, my final poem. Uh, let's see, about four years ago, I'm a, I'm a big walker, and uh, I was crossing the street, and I look, I look, wait for the cars to stop, and, and waving to the gal stopped, and coming this way, a car hit me at like 30 miles an hour. So broke both my legs, eight other bones, concussion, traumatic brain injury, and after that little escapade, uh, you know, I was going through the trauma part, and my trauma therapist said, well, what did you learn from this? And uh, so this poem is kind of like a metaphor, you know, for everything I learned, because uh, before this, I was a pretty dire environmentalist, you know, it's kind of too little, too late. No, no. Uh, but I found the power of regeneration, and uh, this is called Regeneration Ruckus. It's, and it's a history of a place in the Illinois. <clears throat> F4 is a very powerful tornado. Sometimes I look for things, right? Cypress Pond, written in brown ink, with a lovely looping hand on the 1807 field notes of the General Land Office marks the last fingerprint of the Mississippi River pressed into the yielding soil of southern Illinois. The first people gave this swamp to herons and hawks. But by 1900, brash young men ready to squeeze the juice from this fresh world felled the trees, drained the dark, still water, and planted row crops, corn for the cows. Then the dry years came and the wildfires burned hot and fast. After the war, everyone just lost interest and let it be. All alone, the second growth trees slowly tried to remember what it was they meant to say. In 1960, the patient men at State Fish and Game knitted together all the wandering water 
from that ancient swamp into one small lake, flat and blue as an afghan on a sofa. They built tidy blinds where the hunters crouch and the sharp bite of daybreak's chill, waiting, waiting to shoot a duck and feel the grit men once carried in their bones. This stretch of Massac County, still dotted with small farms, quietly spun through the seasons until May 6, 2003, an F4 hit. Sudden, hard, a bolt from above, the winds beyond wind ground through the forest's careless order, left behind an unholy mess. Soon the loggers roared through this shell-shocked land with feller bunchers and grapple skitters as they tenderly hauled out all the blow-down trees set for the sawmill. In the slash left by the buckers and windthrow, the foresters arrived to count every tree still left, stump, standing, or topped. They carefully marked their grids added the numbers, and shrewdly concluded. Repeated disturbances hasten ecological surprises. Now the buckeyes, sassafras, and swamp ash are belting out hot new songs, saplings bursting up from every stump, and frowsy shrubs are running riot in the skid tracks. Each thicket pulses with the beat of nature's deep redemption, grant the smallest claim, and the force of nature blasts back with lusty new rhythms. Thank you. So I'll just conclude with, I'm calling for a green enlightenment. The first enlightenment, we need more of that, dare to think more adherence to science, we still really need that. But I think we also need to dare to care. So I see a world that doesn't really recognize our deep ties to the natural world, doesn't realize how grateful we should be and that we should treat it with respect and caring. So I think we need this kind of change in society from the bottom to the top that places biology at the core of our sciences instead of physics. So uh, with that, I leave you, and I thank you so much for all coming today. It's been really a delight to get to talk with you. you. It only took six days to do all this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> It's taken us a little longer to tear it to shreds. <laughs> For those of you who have questions, raise your hand and I'll pass the microphone around. Watch out, I'll start reading again. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Think about running for office. <laughs> Political yeah, office. Hold us close to your <laughs> Did you ever think about running for political office? You know, Some of these things might swing our politicians. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, like Socrates, they shoot her. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the, our politicians had to be pretty good at ducking these days, you know. Um, thank you so much for that thought. And actually, someone at the Berlin Wall said, uh, I, I wish uh, there would be a woman president back then in 89. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a dear thought, but I think my mission is trying to use the art and poetry to influence people. And yeah, but uh, we sure need more people speaking up for these ideas. Thank you. Alfred? Was, oh, there, go ahead. As a physicist, I object to your last statement <laughs> um, and would like to point out that physics is still the basic knowledge that underlies everything in biology and every, everything else. And in fact, you showed this circle of nodes of different elements of life. Yeah. Um, one that's probably missing from that, we now know that 80% or more of nature is made up of dark matter and dark energy, which we know almost nothing about. Is that proven? Is that yes. proven or theoretical? Yes. Both. 
<laughs> I love physicists, yeah. <laughs> Both, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, a point well taken. I'm not saying throw away physics. I'm not saying throw it away, but I'm saying we need to move uh, the life sciences to the center mm -hmm. of our, our studies and well, be, be guided by them because they're kind of, see, they're the soft, oh, it's kind of like girly, you know. Oh, biology, life sciences. No, life sciences need to be emphasized in a way that they are not. But a point well taken. Yeah. I'm not saying throw away physics mm -hmm. at all. And I know it is crucial to our understanding of biology. Point well taken. And a lot of biology is being done by physicists now. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, more of that. More of that. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Okay, we've got a few more people here. Anyone else? We have right here. Here's a new new person right here. Here we go. Here we go. I have a question about modern poetry. Yes. When I grew up in the 20s, mm -hmm. there were rules of poetry. Mm -hmm. You had to have rhymes mm. and this sort of thing. Mm. That doesn't exist today. Mm -mm. So I'm. My question is, when did this idea change yeah. from these rules? Yeah. Yeah, and there's also an exercise in words, you know, uh -huh. to make matching words. Uh -huh. And that doesn't exist anymore. I, I got that. You I got, got that all covered. If you really read it, yeah. there's a lot of assonance and consonance and, uh, you know, repeating, yeah. repeating. Well, when did this change? Yeah. You may blame, blame uh, largely Walt Whitman in this country. Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman started reading, you know, writing free verse. And, and he, he went like, oh, come on, you know, we, we don't have to be constrained by all the metrics and the, you know, rhyming and so on like that. So really what I've come up with, and it's starting to become like a thing, it's like plain spoken narrative poetry. So the, you know, when you think back to Beowulf and, and the Odyssey, they were telling stories, I right? Know, but I just read them as stories. I don't right. find any... <laughs> Rhyme or reason. Okay, I hear you. I hear you, and uh, and it has changed. It has changed, and and nowadays there are five million. You know, it's just like in the fine arts, there are extremely surreal poets today. Where when I read it, I go like, no. can't tie one word to the next. It's so surreal. Okay, then there are poets who are still doing writing sonnets. Then there are poets who are doing more of this free verse, which is what I, I tend to write. Um, but also I do recommend that you look at it on the page, you know, uh, because the way I do the layout and um, I'm often using uh, the same sounds over and over again. I'm doing using some repetition. Uh, so there is, there are poetic devices through mine. Uh, so I recommend, you know, check out actually reading it. But, uh, but I hear you and and, you know, just like, dang, hasn't everything changed? <laughs> I'm too old. No, no, I don't agree with that. Never. Hi, Arthur Jackson here. <clears throat> uh, since we don't have a lot of people raising their hand, I'd like to throw in something that seemed, to, to, to my mind, to, to lie at the core of what you're really trying to get to and what uh, is, is tough to figure out how to do it. And in my mind, we have a current foundation for civilization, which is spirit causality. That, every, that the spirits are underlying everything and tie everything together. And of course, that's part of what's going on in the USA today. There's a lot of people who object to that whole thing. But for my mind, the, the, the next step is to the foundation for civilization is, is material causality, that everything needs to be tied together. And of course, trying to tie that into the quantum worlds is a, <laughs> is a hard thing. But at any rate, uh, and so far we haven't been able to produce a strong enough vision that can capture the heart of individuals to say, yeah, this is where we need to go and this is how we do it. And obviously we have to do it together and that's of course a, miss a missing part of what's going on in the world today. Uh, no, uh, so selfish people get the rule and we get all the money and that's all it takes. I don't know what you could respond to that, but anyway, mm -hmm. that's something to throw into the pot. Can we uh, clone uh, Al Gore? <laughs> 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 Point well taken, yeah. 
Well, I, I think that um, the free verse poetry uh, is kind of what's happened there is kind of like what's happened with art too, with the uh, non-representational art. Both, both of them liberate the human mind and creativity. However, since human beings tend to go to extremes, I think what has happened is that the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater and uh, the foundations of poetry and the foundations of art, namely balance and symmetry and uh, harmony of opposites, resolution of conflicts, these sorts of things uh, have been thrown out so that if a person literally vomits on a canvas, it can be interpreted as beautiful art. And with poetry, I've listened to some of the poems, the free verse poems of um, so-called uh, experts in poetry, uh, well-known poets, and I taught free verse poetry when I was teaching in school. And I would have told the students in seventh grade to go back and rewrite it. <laughs> now your free verse poetry, as you said, does have some of the foundations of poetry in it. It has rhythm and, and so forth, and there's a certain structure to it. And not paying attention to rhymes has liberated you so that you can even write more beautiful poetry. Mm -hmm. But and there's there's metaphors, right? There's yeah. a lot of metaphors. There's a lot of imagery, and you can tell that it's it's not prose, right? Yeah, so yeah, there's, definitely. There's and an your writing is like that too. When you write your essays, it's like that too, and that's as it should be. Um, but I think today there's so much anti-authoritarianism, and there's so much emphasis on on the individual as being unique. Uh, and, and outliers that we are missing the fact that there is structure to nature and this is what makes mm -hmm. art so beautiful is mm -hmm. we can see the structure and mm -hmm. anyway <laughs> I hear you I hear you but I mean the other great thing is uh, there's such diversity that you can you know, if somebody likes surreal poetry I'm like great I don't know what that is, but okay. <laughs> Great, okay, go for it. If you like sonnets, people are still writing, you know, so that's what I find is the good thing is that uh, you can find whatever your taste is. Uh, there is usually someone out there working in that, that arena, you know, so. Indeed, it's a new name for this new type of writing. Yeah, you know, it's gone even way beyond what I'm doing. There's prose poetry now, so there, and there's flash fiction and flash nonfiction. So a lot of the things that were once like holding the containers of these different types of writing are kind of breaking down, you know, and people are just experimenting and doing different things. And there's also, uh, you know, all these graphic uh, books now. Uh, so uh, adults used to sneer at the comic books, right? But now there are science graphic books and there are are graphic books that I mean mouse was the first one it deals with the Holocaust right and at first people were very upset that uh, this topic should be addressed in this in this manner but uh, I'm all for like yeah do what you want and then you know see if you can touch people right that's that's really if you can communicate if you can get your ideas across if you can touch people's hearts that's the important thing yes my background is uh in cybernetics, uh, masters at Cy San Jose and there, <laughs> uh, and my undergraduate was math and physics, and there is uh, a barb in physics, uh, maybe a fish hook that grabs onto uh, life. Uh, it's a pretty new subject called uh, quantum uh, biology, and uh, that's at the very bottom. And then uh, you can work up from quantum biology up to life. So uh, we stay tuned on that one. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. We need more of that, huh? Hi, Mom. Uh, <laughs> I, this was amazing. This was so wonderful. And thank you so much for creating this amazing space. This yes. was just great. I, I'm a little biased, you know, I, I must admit. But um, I, I just wanted to ask you, I was having a conversation with my roommate the other day, and he's a scientist. And his parents are very religious. They live in uh, the Southwest. 
evangelicals. And he was saying he was talking with them about global warming recently, and they were saying, we don't need to worry about it. God is not going to let the world be destroyed. And my, my comeback to him was, do they count on God to pay into their 401k? You know, do, they, <laughs> do they count on God to intervene if they go in the public square and start shooting a gun off? God would never let somebody die. God, you know. So I, I just was wondering, you know, listening to this, it was just so poignant to me hearing like the message again of, which I've certainly gotten from you a few times before, that we need to do something about this environmental crisis. But how do we bring people along and how do we address people who just, you know, don't want to see it, who it's right in front of their face, but they'll come up with even a silly argument just to abdicate that responsibility. How do we, how do we get people back in touch with their responsibility, this responsibility we all have that I think you're speaking to, the daring to care, this caring that we've forgotten about. How do you, how do you touch people like that? I mean, I, I feel touched by this, but just, you know, the, the, that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, honey. So, um, well, I think when I was 50, uh, that's when I switched into the writing. And my personal answer was, you know, I was doing all of this conceptually based artwork and, uh, you know, I'd put the show up and I'd have my wall text and people would come to the show and I'd go like, this is about endocrine disruption, oh my god, you know. And uh, <laughs> they'd go like, I have to go get a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> so I went like, well, maybe people who listen to poetry, you know, more involved with ideas, you know. Uh, you know, I kind of went from art to poetry, oh, much more direct way of confronting these problems. But it, that was my way, right? And I think that uh, we are really, when I was 50, I started going like, oh, my God, people just are not going to deal with this. This is humanity. We always wait. I mean, we even do this in our personal lives where we can see the problem is out there. As I used to say to you when you were young, I said, well, you can learn about this in one of two ways. You can either listen to me or you can have the consequences come. And that's a harder way to learn it, but you have two ways, right? And uh, honestly, I mean, I'm just, you know, aghast, as I'm sure we all are, that uh, we're seeing this increase in the severity of storms. We have a hundred million dead trees in the Sierra. The whole Northwest is like, it's apocalypse, apocalypse now. And uh, it, it's due to our behavior. It's not due to any beings, right? But I think also it's so hard for us to take responsibility, right? And go like, oh, I'm driving my car around. It's me. And it is me. Okay, I'm not saying it's anyone else. I'm part of this. It's almost impossible to live a really environmental, uh, you know, life in a society that's not geared that way, right? So that's what I'm talking about, this switch from the bottom to the top. And what I saw in... East Berlin. So when I went over there and I gathered the hopes and fears, um, I, I had people from the East in West Berlin who were coaching me when I went over there. And they said, don't do it in any of the big squares. They have cameras and surveillance everywhere and they will arrest you in 20 seconds. So they told me, go to this little bar, go to this place, you know. So I ended up, um, you know, at a gay bar. And it was so amazing because this was not like my, you know, stereotype of what was happening in East Berlin, right? And they were just such wonderful guys and they, they took me in and, you know, I was pretty, and I was just drinking orange juice. They kept plying me with orange juice and I was like, okay, I think that's enough orange juice. But, and, uh, you know, I, I said to one of them, you know, like, uh, well, you know, we're hearing about changes and, you know, there's a little bit of organizing down in Dresden and, and they said, oh, oh no, Hanukkah will be here for another 2,000 years, right? No. <laughs> and uh, the, the force of the state in that society seemed absolutely frozen in place, so powerful, right? You, you just couldn't wiggle a little toenail without them knowing what you were up to. So... But look at that, six months later, six months later. And it actually was religious communities that started the change, right? So they, the Shazi couldn't come into this church down in Dresden. They started, they were organized, they were meeting there for years, for years. 
And then, uh, you know, it just kept building. And then one day they got everyone marching to the wall, right? And uh, so w my idea is that sometimes it seems like, you know, the system is so rigid, it's irrevocable, it cannot change, that is it. And then suddenly, whoops, it was all just an illusion, right? So we are human beings, we do learn, and maybe we're not fast learners sometimes, but as more and more of us start uh, getting the impacts of what we're doing, our behavior, I'm hoping that this becomes, uh, you know, a, a, the green enlightenment emerges. Uh, you know, the third section is all about uh, toxics. And uh, hormonal disruption, right? And I just had my son, this was starting to become available on the internet. I'm so horrified by this, you know. I would go to dinner parties and I'd go like, do you know what's happening with hormone disruption? Oh my God, this, this, this. And one time a woman said to me, Deborah, how can you think about this stuff all the time? And she had a point. I was at a dinner party, so. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, in this society, people are suffering with the consequences of this behavior, and it's still being like, oh, it's that family's sorrow. It's their grief. No, we're poisoning our children. And Europe is responding, and we are not here. Uh, Obama finally got through a new law to regulate the chemical industry since 1970, since the first law that was instituted in 1970 that was entirely inadequate at that point. They just grandfathered in everything they were making and went like, well, that's fine. So my hope is, uh, to wind this up, that uh, you know, as we see more and more evidence of this, but also in schools I find you know, they teach everybody everything except the most important thing. Right? So the girls are all getting breast cancer from walking around with their phones in their bras. Right? Have no idea. I ask my students, what is plastic? What is it made from? And they go, plastic? I <laughs> mean, plastic's made from plastic. I'm going like, no, it's made from <laughs> petrochemicals, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, education, that, you know, I'm a teacher, that's, that's also the only real hope we have, so. All right, but, that's, that's yeah. all we have time for. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all so much.